Well, we're going to go on now to another aspect of schizophrenia, and it's really, it really teaches us another important lesson. Whenever possible, start as early in these disorders as you can before things get more and more complicated. So our next speaker, they're complicated enough, the next speaker is Kristen, Kristen, uh, Kristen Cadenhead. She's a professor of psychiatry. She's been with us first as a resident and then as a faculty member. She's been with us since 1987. She is currently the director of the residency and as I will forever be grateful to Sid Zizek for all of his wonderful work in there. Kristen has been part of what it is that he's been doing for years, and I think that she is uh, doing an excellent job uh, having taken over. She is also the director of the Cognitive Assessment and Risk Evaluation Early Psychosis Program, and she's worked extensively with young patients. So this is a fitting fourth lecture before we turn on to a more general discussion. Kristen. Well, I'm very pleased to be speaking today and also following this great group of researchers. And I have to say that I was very fortunate to grow up and really learn a lot of the research skills that I have uh, from this group of, of people. I was fortunate to have Dave Braff as a primary mentor and to work with Mark and Neil and Greg Light. And I think that a lot of the things I learned in, in their lab uh, really helped me, help to inspire what I did later in my career. Um, I think that the background in translational research has always stayed with me, and it's always a part of my thinking and my research. So I'll be discussing um, the work I've been doing in the early phases of psychosis, and I have to say that in 1999, I was at an ACNP lecture, and I heard somebody speak about the prodromal period of illness. And I felt like I had had an epiphany. And I remember Martin Paulus was also there. And I started looking into this area and realizing that there really wasn't very much biological uh, psychiatry going on. And I saw a window of opportunity to be able to use some of the skills that I had developed in, into phenotypes and, and genetics of schizophrenia and apply it to the early stages of illness. Um, this was something that had been a passion for me previously, and it, it had such a meaningful um, uh, piece to me because it, the idea of being able to do something to really change the course of this illness. Um, so I think most of us know what a horrible um, disease schizophrenia and psychosis can be, very disabling, and it, it often takes a couple of years before it's recognized. And so the idea behind this area of research is to identify early, figure out what's going on in the brain, and intervene uh, with the hopes of altering the course or disability of the illness. And I, I always show this slide by Thompson et al. that shows uh, the brains of individuals that had early onset schizophrenia. And you can see in the, in the middle section um, that there is a loss of gray matter during the first five years of illness. Uh, and it kind of mirrors what happens in a normal brain with development. But when I look at this, I see it as a window of opportunity, that if we can do something when there's so much active change in the brain in late adolescence, maybe we can make a difference. And so the psychosis prevention, early intervention area, we. I've always thought of it as, as really having three pillars. You know, can we identify it early? Uh, can we figure out what the mechanism of disease is? And then can we target the, inter can we target the illness um, according to what we understand about the pathology? Um, so when you look at the course of schizophrenia development, um, I think most of us are familiar that it occurs uh, usually in late adolescence, but there's typically a prodromal period that can be anywhere from a few weeks to years. You see a decline in, in psychosocial functioning prior to the onset of illness as you see an increase in subsyndromal psychotic symptoms. Um, we, uh, you know, a number of groups across the world have developed 
uh, structured interviews and specific diagnostic criteria that I won't take you through, but it's basically subsyndromal psychotic symptoms with some level of insight. So they haven't crossed the threshold of full psychotic disorder. And using these specific criteria, we can identify young people just clinically really or demographically or family history um, who 15% develop a psychotic illness within a year, 30% develop uh, psychosis within two years. Most of those are schizophrenia spectrum. And this is a meta-analysis showing, um, showing uh, this uh, survival curve um, and rate of conversion. So I started this work myself in 99 when I received an R01 in this area. And after I had been working in this area independently for about five years, NIMH came to me as well as about six or seven other researchers across the country that were doing similar work. And they said, hey, we want you to work together. Um, we want to capitalize on our investment, bring you together. And so uh, this was really work that all started independently, but ended up in, the in our consortium that we called Naples, or the North American Prodromal Longitudinal Studies Consortium. So we, uh, we, pulled, we pulled all of our data together that we had collected in independent sites for the first phase of the study. And in doing this, we looked at which factors within the individuals we had identified were more predictive. So they all fit a standard criteria. And we were able to identify five main areas. And it turned out that you could combine any three of these and predict with 80% certainty who was going to later develop a psychotic illness. We uh, decided to capitalize on some of these early findings. And we, um, we incorporated a number of biomarkers, including neuropsychological testing. And in this study, Larry Seidman was the first author. Um, and to focus down here, this is, these are z-scores z and normalized to normal controls. But it turns out that those individuals who later developed psychosis at baseline had some of the most severe neuropsychological functioning. So we included neuropsychological testing along with many of the other factors we had identified in a brand new sample. And we decided, wow, can we develop something like a risk calculator? Much like you would see in the Framingham Heart Study where you develop a calculator or you can develop a calculator of risk for things like cancer. Um, so that was our goal. Um, so we went to a statistician uh, who had done a lot of work in cancer and said, can you help us develop this calculator? And so without going through all the details, this is basically what it looked like. We, uh, we used the literature as well as our phase one study to identify which factors might go into a calculator. And there were a couple of neuropsychological measures, things like verbal learning and processing speed, uh, stressful life events. Turned out it was not hallucinations that were predictive, but it was more things like paranoia or delusional symptoms decline in functioning, getting bullied as a child. So we had a number of factors. And it turned out that we were able to uh, develop this risk calculator um, with a pretty decent area under the curve um, using these criteria that was quite comp comparable to what you might see in something like breast cancer or prostate cancer prediction of outcome of illness. This was published in the American Journal. Um, and if you go online, this is what it looks like. They're little, little sliders that you can slide according to what somebody's individual score is, and then it will create uh, your risk score. And so some of the key predictors, as I mentioned before, were verbal learning, slow processing speed, more of paranoia suspiciousness. And so we see the psychosis risk cal calculator is similar to what's used in other forms of somatic illness. And it can be, um, it, and we see it as a, as a measure that can be used to identify those that are at highest risk. So for example, if you want to do uh, pharmacologic intervention and you're dealing with adolescents and you want somebody that has an even higher risk of developing the disease, that might be a better uh, group to use. 
and also in terms of biomarker studies, understanding the mechani mechanism of disease, it can help reduce the size of the sample you need to get a conversion rate up above what I, the, the ones you get with clinical alone. We, uh, we have a whole biomarker panel. I won't go into every detail, but I'll just give you a taste of what we're doing because we get biomarkers on all of these individuals. Um, this just shows um, some of what we've done with the uh, gray matter uh, thickness data. Um, it turns out that a more rapid decline in gray matter thickness is also predictive of who will later develop a psychotic illness. And so this is the gray matter, but uh, we can also uh, focus on interventions that target those specific biomarkers and the mechanism that they elucidate. Um, and we want to use the biomarkers in the calculator as well, and that's the next step that we're working on. This is just an example of the work that Elaine Walker and our consortium has done. You can look at AM cortisol. Uh, again, stress, adversity is a risk factor for the development of psychosis. And so you can measure AM cortisol. And these are baseline cortisol measures. And those who later became psychotic had the highest level. Deanna Perkins has really spearheaded some of the work with plasma DNA. Um, and in this paper, uh, she, uh, she worked in developing a uh, blood-based diagnostic marker using measures of oxidative stress and inflammation and was able to, uh, uh, we, can, we can predict those who later become psychotic um, versus those who didn't. And um, similarly, uh, this generates a pretty decent uh, predictive model. Um, we, this would be a very easy biomarker to incorporate into an office visit, for example. Um, it's been validated in other samples, um, and other groups across the country have been able to, or across the world, have also developed similar markers. We're doing a similar thing using a, using a polygenic risk score. Uh, using data from psychotic illness that's, again, stored, and we can, we can use that. Um, I haven't let go of the startle uh, paradigm that I learned in the lab years ago. Um, this is some preliminary data I haven't published yet, looking at just startle latency. Um, and it turns out that those individuals who later converted to psychosis had the longest latency. Um, and uh, this graph um, shows that a head-to-head -head, uh, competition between um, some of those referential thoughts, paranoia, uh, is comparable um, to, to what you see in startle latency as a predictor. And it turns out that startle latency is also uh, highly correlated with some of the connectivity measures. Uh, Alan Anasevic, uh, who's worked with our group, um, generated these based on resting state MRI. And, um, and it turns out those who converted were the most highly correlated. So what about intervention? Well, in the prodromal phase of illness, there have really been relatively few studies on intervention, and the area is actually pretty wide open. Um, and turns out cognitive behavioral therapy um, has been one of the more effective interventions, both in reducing symptoms and preventing later development of a psychotic illness. Antipsychotics have not really uh, been very effective in preventing later development of psychosis. Um, but what I'd really like to do is do a study using the calculator to identify those at highest risk, because it may be that with this very heterogeneous sample, you don't, you don't have the individuals that are really um, on the verge of psychosis. Um, and then there's, there have been studies with omega-3 fatty acids. And this is an example of an omega-3 trial uh, that came out in 2010. Um, Aminger et al., and it was almost too good to be true. This is the group who was um, on the 
and this looks this is survival. So the group who was on placebo had a high rate of conversion, where, whereas those who were not on it did not, um, who were on on the um, omega three did not convert to psychosis. And um, two groups, um, our Naples group. This is a study that I headed. Um, as well as another European group, both tried to replicate it and could not replicate this finding. I haven't given up yet. Um, turns out that if you, if you look at dietary omega-3 measured either by a questionnaire or with red blood cell membrane um, uh, omega-3 content, um, it's uh, highly associated with things like functioning, that those who have low omega-3 in the diet have poor functioning. And if you, you know, this is regardless of whether they were on omega-3 or placebo, it turns out that the group who um, had low um, omega-3 in their cell membranes was more likely to convert to psychosis. So in terms of ongoing studies, that's my alarm, and I will mention this quickly. Um, I, my work also includes uh, not only the prodrome, but first episode of psychosis, and we're working hard to develop an unmedicated sample. Um, this, is, this is a collaboration with a group in Mexico, and Chris Akeem is also a part of this, and so we're, we're working on finishing up that study. And some of the preliminary data shows that some of the inflammatory markers that are part of our panel are highly associated with symptoms, like negative symptoms. And uh, we also have a study, I'm happy to collaborate with Wat Jin in our department um, on a, it's an antioxidant trial using broccoli root. Um, this is through a Stanley um, Foundation study in China. And uh, uh, cannabinoids have generated a lot of interest in early psychosis. Um, and uh, this is a study, there have been a couple of studies that shows that, show that CBD uh, can really, uh, may ha have some antipsychotic effects and may be just as effective as an antipsychotic in treating early symptoms of psychosis. Um, we're on the verge of starting a new study funded um, by the UCSD Center for Integrative Research and the Krupp Endowed Fund. Um, and also I've connected with the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research in doing this. And so we're going to be looking at whether CBD augmentation in first episode patients um, can improve psychotic symptoms. There's evidence it may improve cognition. Um, and, and it may also act through some anti-inflammatory means. Um, so, uh, so this is interesting. We also want to look at feeding behavior. And I know eating disorders is also looking at this. And I, I have a couple of studies going on. Uh, Eric Granholm um, has been very involved in this study we're doing in prodrobal subjects. Uh, using cognitive behavioral social skills training. There's a plug for his book. A and, um, and, you know, I think that this was mentioned before, you know, how many great psychologists we have in our department, and it was really wonderful to be able to pull Eric aside and collaborate with him in this study. And then uh, Beth Twomley um, in compensatory cognitive training. Uh, we have a study that we're doing in collaboration with a group in Mexico City. We have Spanish versions of the uh, measure, so we're, we're doing that. We're finishing that up right now. And uh, this is acknowledging the research that I just talked about, um, and I've already acknowledged my colleagues here at UCSD who I've worked with for many years. So thank you very much.